do you know Sandra Day O'Connor? Well, it's an interesting journey. Um, I started working for the state of Arizona in 1970. And Justice O'Connor uh, went into the state Senate, uh, and I think she was born in 69 and then ran in 70 and 72, so she had two full terms. And I started working in unemployment insurance, and so I, you know, you hear of people, mm-hmm. but I was a part-time employee out in Mesa, Arizona. And uh, as, as my career went along, I was, I was active in the Employee Association. And, but I was gone for two, uh, in 72 for uh, active duty for the Army Reserves and I came back. And in 73, I was, um, you know, moving up in the Employee Association and we were moving legislation through for employees. And it was, you know, retirement system and this kind of stuff. And that's when I first met her. Now, I was a young, I was 23 years old, 24 years old, my first met. And, you know, she was just always so very pleasant to deal with. You'd go and have a little conversation with her and then move on. Um, but it, uh, and so I, it was just kind of that, but she knew who I was and I knew her. And and, uh, uh, and then she finished up her term in 74 and I came back down to Phoenix in 74, but um, 75, but she had a place in Prescott. Um, at uh, Iron, Springs. Iron Springs, and so me and my, and my wife uh, Martha, you know, we both played golf, and we'd be out at a little country club, and we're out there one day, we're at the off, and she comes walking up, you know, and uh, says, you know, Joe, do you mind if I join you? So we played eighteen holes of golf together, and we would just bump in like that, uh, and we ended up having more of a personal relationship rather than a political relationship. And uh, I became fast friends later in the 70s with a guy named Bill Jaquin, who had been president of the Senate and was the executive director of their state chamber of commerce. And so I would run into Justice O'Connor at a couple of uh, Bill's functions. Um, and so we would just meet socially, but we always had a, a chat. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I watched her with a lot of admiration because she was, you know, and you'll hear from Representative Hamilton on, on, on what she was able to do, and I watched that with just great um, respect. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, when uh, when she was appointed uh, to the Supreme Court, after you know she had been appointed to the appellate court in Arizona by Bruce Babbitt, uh, after she had won election to uh, be a uh, Supreme Court judge, and then Governor Babbitt appointed her to the state appellate court. And so I didn't see her. My partner, Don Schaller, was a very good friend of hers uh, and her husband. Uh, and so when he'd go to D.C., uh, he'd get to tour the Supreme Court settings and all this kind of stuff. And uh, one of the funnest stories was, um, you know, uh, right now I'm married. We were stopping in DNA Western Hotel to have a cocktail. It's up. It's no longer there. It's up on on the north by side. And uh, I'm paying the cabin where he says, oh my goodness, there's Justice O'Connor. And I'm paying the cabin. He says, yes, I know her. And my wife goes, yeah, sure. And so we turned around and uh, and then she comes walking up. She says, Joe, how are you doing? And uh, you know, so I, I, I notched a, a positive with, with my Mary. You know, she says, hey, he's not as much of a BSer as, as I thought he was. So. Uh, so, do you recall the first time that you met her? I met her uh, in the legislature. Okay. Um, you know, I was, I think at the time, I was the secretary of the employee union, statewide secretary. And we would go around and meet, uh, you know, they were, we were pushing some retirement reform and pay for employees. And as a as, uh, uh, majority leader, we, we stopped by our office. And, you know, those were the days when, you know, you could have you know, pleasant meetings. I mean, she was a dem- she was a Republican from Tucson, uh, which means the Tucson Republicans were moderate Republicans mm-hmm. um, and very forward thinking. But she was always, you know, would present what we're trying to do and she would help. Mm-hmm. You know, she'd say, if you talk to so-and-so, you talk to so-and-so, and so I'm the young guy, you know, mm-hmm. so, oh my goodness. Uh, and so that always, <laughs> her approach to legislation always, you know, Set and I, you know, it made a big impression on me. Mm-hmm. 
because uh, you go meet some people and you'll, you know, we don't have time to talk about these kinds of things. But she was always very respectful uh, and very um, uh, understanding. Now, it doesn't mean you had to vote. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. You didn't know you had to vote. But she would also uh, try to understand what you're trying to do and uh, uh, figure out a way it's, it was good for the state first, you know, and uh, and she always knew when you wanted her, don't, don't try to BS her. <laughs> She had that reputation. A lot of times, you know, a lot of us go in and try to you know, do a high five and uh, not, not with Justice O'Connor. And, uh, and of course, you've seen it, sir. You know, it's, it's working for her. I mean, you know, that, that was well honed before she got to the Supreme Court. But, uh, That's true. So, um, do you recall your reaction then when you heard that President Reagan had nominated her to the Supreme Court? I was, um, uh, you know, I was surprised, um, and uh, it, it was, uh, how does an appellate court judge in uh, Arizona, a very well thought of judge, I mean, she's very well thought of, uh, how, how, how did this happen? And uh, and so you noodle around as an old political guy like I was, and you, and you find out there's always backstories. And of course, uh, Justice Rehnquist, I'm sure, had, had, had a lot to do with it. They went to, law school together at Stanford. Uh, but also Bruce Babbitt and uh, Ronald Reagan had a, had a unique uh, relationship. Um, and uh, Ronald Reagan greatly respected Governor Babbitt. Uh, and I won't get into what, why that is, but they, they had a great relationship. In fact, in the State of the Union speech, uh, President Reagan called out Babbitt as a leading governor. Um, and in, in the I understood later that Babbitt did have some back channel conversations with the White House President, the President, you know, and, uh, obviously in, in, uh, supporting uh, the nomination of Justice mm -hmm. O'Connor. Mm -hmm. um, so you've mentioned the story in Washington where Mary said, "Yeah, look, you know, you she realized that you were telling that you truthful when you said you knew her." Is there any other? favorite story of your interaction with her. Tell us maybe about the time you watched uh, election returns. Well, you know, I, I, I went on the O'Connor Institute board um, and where, where she and I got to kind of reestablish our, our relationship. And, and uh, you know, I'm a native, Arizona third generation native, I guess, and uh, she's a second generation native of Arizona. Or maybe she's first. Uh, but my family arrived in Northern Arizona in 1880, and her family arrived in Southern Arizona in 1877. And every time I'd see her, I'd be able to our sidebar, she's not going to show. My family was here three years before your family got here. Because that was always, you know, it's always something we had had between us. Um, she, she was um, uh, an interesting lady. You know, Arizona's, you know, those of us who had family in the state way before statehood, you know, Arizona did not become a state until uh, 1912. And so there's there's kind of pioneer stories, and, and her family was a pioneer. My family on a much smaller scale were pioneers in, in northern Arizona. And you always kind of had that just kind of fall back on having conversation. And so, um, you know, as you know, I have a wine rate, and, and she would come over to our wine tasting. So I'd have a wine tasting in my house, and she would show up. Uh, Rose Mofford would show up, and then they'd come in and basically hold hold court. People would just love love to talk to them, and that's 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 the way I grew up in politics. Was people in your home, and, and she was just she never thought she was better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. She always thought she was just in Arizona, mm -hmm. uh, doing the best she could for the state. And so in, I think it was 2014, the, the, uh, uh, the midterms, uh, E.J. Young uh, was in town, he's a columnist and uh, works at Brookings Institute. He was in town for another uh, event we had. And so I invited her to join us at my house. Uh, and so she, she came in, you were there, my daughter Debbie was there and we watched the, the midterms, drank a little wine and, and had a little food. And, and she was so, focused and so understood exactly what was going on uh, and always easy to have a conversation with. Um, now that doesn't mean that if she had an opinion that she thought somebody ought to hear that they heard it and, and you better be prepared when you're going to make an opinion about something. But 
you know, you had that picture of BJ sitting there, and he, he was just, he was mesmerized if you saw that picture. Um, what what an honor it was for him to be able to sit in my family room there and watch it. And he was just beside himself. And here's a guy who walks, the, you know, the halls of Congress and powers in Washington, D.C., and he knew this was a special time, he was a very special person. And so I, re I remember that, you know, really a, as uh, my latest and fondest memory. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd always have fun at the Institute dinners and functions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I, I watched her very carefully as uh, on your board and, and you did a great job, sir. Mm -hmm. She was, you better have your facts straight and you better shoot straight. But, but she always, the, the great thing about uh, Justice O'Connor, it's always, are we doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. And an another event I remember is when we had kind of the old guard, my heart and Alfredo, and, mm -hmm. and folks came in, remember our dinner at the O'Connor house, mm -hmm. and she was there. I mean, it, it was just, those were magical times. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like I'm the luckiest guy in the world, at least the luckiest guy in Arizona, to be mm -hmm. able to live through those. Right. And been able to participate in, in government and watch role models like her teach us all mm -hmm. how to how to be a, a public servant. Mm -hmm. I, I wish we could put some of the people we have today in the same kind of training session with her so she could teach them how to be public servants mm -hmm. uh, because she was, she was one of the very best. Mm -hmm. So let me ask, since you're from a pioneer family within three years of each other, the Day family, how do you think Justice O'Connor's uh, the influence of growing up on the Lazy Bee impacted her life's work in terms of her character. Well, I, I think it, even though it was, a, it was, it was the Lazy Bee was a pretty big ranch. Mm -hmm. I can't remember how many. It was, it was a couple hundred thousand acres, and she went to school at a uh, I think probably Catholic uh, school in El Paso. Mm -hmm. And um, and so in the pioneer times, those kinds of schools uh, really were big. Uh, in the, how people got developed. Uh, in Northern Arizona, there was a place called the St. Joseph's Academy in Crescent. And my mother's family were from Asheville. And my grandfather had a general store and was a postmaster, but they all went to Prescott to go to boarding school. And so, you know, there's some parallel to, you know, uh, and how people got educated. But when you're, when you're a pioneer and you're living on a ranch or you're living in a little town called Ashford, uh, it's it's a lot different. Uh, I really kind of like it too. As I when I first uh, bought my place up in Northern California, it was back to a, a little town called Hillsburg, which at the time then only had about eight thousand people in it. Um, and it was it was a big change. But I was born and raised in Prescott, when it was only about ten thousand. Mm -hmm. And so you grow up with a different uh, you grow up with a different uh, perspective. Now, her growing up in Southern Arizona. She had a very large exposure to uh, Hispanic Americans uh, because not too long before they got there, that was part of Mexico, you know. And her family got there thirty years after it was uh, purchased. But and so she always had um, uh, uh, great respect uh, and understanding of the Hispanic community, and uh, you could just sit in her interactions, whether it was with Alfredo. Uh, or Lito Pina, mm -hmm. uh, and people I knew, uh, you know, you could just see that she was very comfortable walking in those shoes. Uh, and and so when you grow up in rural, rural America, not just in Arizona, but Pioneer, where there wasn't all the amenities that you might have in rural Wisconsin or something like that, out here, you learn you learn different things, you know, pictures of her on horseback and, and uh, those kinds of things. Well, those are skill sets that, that require focus. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I, you know, I cherish my pioneer roots, and I know she cherished hers very much. So, yeah. so um, has Sandra Day O'Connor influenced you on a personal level or professional? She, level? she has on a on a uh, professional level. Uh, when I was in government, and you know, my career, I went to, uh, pretty quickly for a young guy, but. Um, Republicans and Democrats during during the 70s, late 60s, 70s, and even in the 80s when Governor Bat was there, it was, hey, elections are over and we're, we're governor. Now, I was a, a Democrat, uh, 
and but my best friends were people like Burton Barr and Carl Knasik and mm -hmm. and those folks. Now, you know, when the election was over, I signed the government. You know, we're going to disagree on policy, uh, and you know, we can see who's got the votes. Mm -hmm. But um, and watching her role model that, and we've all seen it now, mm -hmm. uh, how she would help bring people together in a social setting to to get things done, uh, and. I remember doing the same thing. I mean, we would go to Oaxaca, uh, which is no longer there, you know, on 17th and, and Van Buren, um, you know, a Hispanic restaurant. And, it, you know, we got a lot done at Oaxaca, you know. Uh, and and so it, it's things that I wish that we could, you know, I'm kind of, I hate being the old man going, well, in the good old days, this is how we did things. Uh, and But that's how we did things. Uh, in this state, and everybody was out to what's best for the state. And, and some of the legislation that Arizona developed, you know, it was groundbreaking legislation for the entire country. The Water Act that Bruce Babbitt personally negotiated in Arizona as governor uh, is still considered one of the best water uh, uh, conservation acts in the country. The work that we all did together on uh, the access program. Uh, which really was a precursor, quite frankly, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and, and the access program was a bipartisan program. Uh, the Democrats tried to negotiate with Jimmy Carter as president, couldn't get it across the goal line. And so we switched party and then Carl Kanasik and the folks, you know, uh, went to the White House with the Democrats. Andy Hurwitz was chief of staff of Bruce Babbitt and Art Alfredo. They got and so we just switched. Okay, we got a Republican, unless we cut it, we couldn't cut a deal with Jimmy Carter, we wouldn't allow it. We went to the Reagan administration, they allowed it. But they went together. And uh, I, my only hope for our country is that we can kind of get back to those kinds of um, processes uh, mm -hmm. to do the very, very best for our country. And she taught me that. Mm -hmm. And she was a living model of that. So. Final question. What do you think is Sandra Day O'Connor's most important contribution to society? I, I think there's not just one, there's, there's many. Um, you, know, uh, you know, it was tough for her being a woman, uh, you know, coming out of law school, not being able to get a, uh, be hired by a law firm. My mother, you know, uh, it was a little older than justice. I mean, it was the same thing. When you, when, in that generation, you came out of school. You basically had two or three options. You could be a nun. You really wanted to run something. They were running the universities. You want to be a nurse or you want to be a teacher. And so, you know, my mother was a, was a teacher, a darn good one. And Justice O'Connor was a hell of a lawyer. And, but did she let, you know, the system say, no, she got a job in the public sector, right? Mm -hmm. The public sector appreciated her. And so she showed uh, her ability and it was always a higher test for a woman than it was for a man. And I, I, I was in the state government early 70s and I saw it. I mean, I had people saying, well, we have to give this job to the man because he has a family at home and he's got a feed. You know, I mean, I, I actually, there were actually comments on selection committee saying things like that. And, but she persevered. And the great thing is uh, she ran for office and was elected. She was elected state senator from Tucson. And when she stepped down from the uh, legislature, her husband was a law firm here at Kings. And what she do? She ran and she was elected judge. And, you know, Arizona kind of had a, uh, a great history of, of women leadership. I mean, uh, I think her name was Laura Lockwood, was the first state Supreme Court justice in the entire United States. She was the Supreme Court justice of Arizona. But I think that, you know, her leadership and her breaking the glass ceilings, or whatever you want to call it, I mean, Acted as role model for other women uh, that you persevere. Yeah, in many ways the deck is stacked against you, but don't let that define you. Just do the very best you can, and she did. And she was highly recognized for that. So I think that was one of the things uh, adding to. And you see in Arizona with great female leadership. I mean, from Jan Napolitano to to. Uh, uh, Rose Mofford. Rose Mofford was a dear friend to, um, uh, she was, she became senator when, I mean, governor when uh, 
Symington uh, had a resign. She'd been speaker of the house. Uh, really fantastic. But she also, but the other thing that's been enduring to her, and I think you'll see, you saw this when she was on the Supreme Court, she could make deals. Okay, and so you know some of the things that you read is that she she, she had the ability to bring people together and to solve problems. Now, in some in some ways, that's not admired on the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you mean? Well, but she came from a legislative background. I think she was the only Supreme Court justice that actually uh, came out of a legislative background, mm -hmm. uh, where she had to be able to uh, cut deals. Mm -hmm. And I remember in 1972, the Democrats took, took control in 74, I should say. But, but she had to work with Art Hamilton, who we got talked to, Alfredo Gutierrez. And to get things done, you couldn't just say, well, it's my way or the highway. And she used those great skills that she had with people to get things done, to get things done for the state. Not for her, but for the state and for the people of Arizona. And everybody remembers that. So her legacy is one being a woman and, and, and really progressing and achieving as a woman uh, and, and her whole personality and how she brought people together for the common good and for the best for her. So those are, to, to me, is just one 